there it is. Okay. When he brought that home, I was disappointed, I guess is to say that the, to say the least, I was disappointed that he brought that home. Um, because it should be long dead by now, these pyramids. Um, <laughs> did they get it going again with a flux capacitor? Oh, you guys are, you guys are a funny group tonight. Awesome. Okay. So fear, food pyramid and the evolution of lies. Is the share showing? Hopefully. Yeah. Yes. Okay, like I said, I was gonna talk about salt. We'll talk about salt in a couple of weeks. I will not have a live next week because I will be on an airplane. I am very excited. I'm going to another coaching con um, for health and nutrition this weekend. It's always fun to meet up with like-minded people and learn more and um, meet some of the big wigs in the business. So it's really, really exciting. So they will not be live next Monday. The following Monday, we'll probably talk about salt and sodium because I know that that's um, another one of those, just like cholesterol, one of those subjects that's really confusing. And there's been a lot of misinformation and confusing stuff surrounding salt and sodium and what that can do um, and impact. But like I said, I got a little bit sidetracked when Peyton walked home <laughs> last week and handed me the food pyramid and sat down and talked about how we need to be eating this, that, or the other. And I was like, oh, honey, no. Okay, so. Uh, it, this actually starts long before we're going to start our timeline. It starts in the, in the 1800s. We're going to start with kind of the first guides that came out. They were called the basic seven. Then they moved into the basic four. Then we found a food wheel, which then turned into a more visually appealing food pyramid. We knew we had the food pyramid for quite a, a bit of time. That's evolved into my plate uh, and then kind of current recommendations and what I would expect. Or what, not what I would expect, what I would recommend. Um, so let's start with the basic seven. So this was actually, this was released in 1943 and it was a leaflet in a national wartime guide. And it was basically, families were having a hard time navigating food portions. Uh, this is during World War II. So um, they had food uh, rations and basically what the USDA was trying to do at that point is just ensure that families had a very basic understanding of what they should be consuming every day to maintain general health. And the focus was a foundational diet, not a total diet, meaning it didn't talk about sugars or fats specifically. It didn't have caloric recommendations. It was basically eat something every day from one of these, from all of these categories in order to maintain general wellness, body functioning. Like um, if you can see some of these it says good eyesight pays and protect yourself from illness. That's what some of these cartoon, cartoons on this say. Um, builds muscle or 10 strike for energy. So it came out with these basic sevens and there were no recommendations for serving sizes or how many to have. It was, this was basic, a basic foundational just to maintain general wellness through the times of food rationings and a lot of confusion surrounding food during that time. So you have you have group one, and it's and again, it's like you're just you just have to at minimum eat one thing from each of these groups every single day. That that was our first recommendation. So group one there um, is greens and yellow vegetables, and group two is orange tomatoes and group um, oranges, tomatoes and grapefruits, and group three is potatoes and other vegetables and other fruits. Group four is milk and milk products. Group five is meat, poultry, fish, or eggs. Um, group six is our breads, grains, and cereals. And group seven is our mud, butter um, and fortified margarines. Okay. So notice that there's nothing here about sugars, nothing here about water, nothing here about anything. It was basic, hey, make sure you're getting at least one of these things every single day so you can maintain general health. Um, that had some resistance because it was so vague, right? So, um, you know, imagine that your family trying to maintain well health, you've got food rations and so then they modified it. Um, again, yeah, so this was the intent the intent that people would start with these basics and then add more to their diets as they felt necessary, not to stop here, but to start here. Um, but it was vague. Okay. So in 1946, they updated it to recommend to include recommended serving sizes. So it looked almost identical. Um, and they, they again, they said, okay, well, here are the seven groups. And um, if you see at the very bottom of this is a poster from 1946, it's so funny because I don't even know how you interpret this. In addition to the basic seven, 
eat anything else that you want. <laughs> Just eat any other foods that you want, right? Like, oh, okay. But again, this was a foundational diet. Just in order to maintain general wellness, make sure you're getting a little bit of variety in your day. That's what they were trying to say. Um, and then they, again, there's no guidance on sugar or anything here. Um, but then they added in some serving sizes. So you can see from your leafy greens and uh, leafy greens, yellows and, and, and yellow vegetables have one or more serving a day. And from your citrus fruit, tomatoes and you know cabbage have one or more. So they're all the same categories, but they've just added in serving sizes. Um, so two or more servings. And then down there in milk, children, three to four cups of milk a day or adults, two or more cups. Um, but uh, this was also problematic. Uh, it, it was met with kind of general confusion. It was, it was almost too complex with too few details, which it seems like a little bit of a contradiction, but there, was, there were these you know, seven groups and it wasn't clear what a serving size was and how do you portion that out? And what does it mean to eat any other foods that you want, right? But, this wasn't intended to be like a day-by-day -day guide. It was intended to be, this is where you should start your healthy diet, but not end it. And it just, it was just unclear, okay? So that was around until about 1956. And because the basic seven was met with a little bit of resistance because it was confusing for people, it was simplified. They simplified it down in 1956 to this thing called the basic four. And they had the milk group, the meat group, the vegetable and fruit group, and the bread and cereal group. Okay? And, and this was used for a few decades thereafter. This was used throughout um, uh, through near the end of 1970s. And this was exactly what it sounds like. It was just, these are some general recommendations from these food groups. Again, notice there's not a whole lot of guidance or any guidance on sugars or fats or anything like that. Um, but you've got these four main, group, main groups, which are milk, meat, vegetable, fruit, bread, and cereal. Um, with some, some, um, some general serving sizes there. The interesting thing that I want to point out here is that your vegetable and fruit group um, have more or four, uh, four or more servings, but so do the bread and cereal group. Um, and the bread and cereal group say that it's a whole grain or enriched or restored, right? So about equal portions of those. Now, if you think back to, I think a lot of you probably were, grew up in an era like I did where we had the food pyramid. And if you remember the food pyramid, the very base of that bad boy was our breads and our cereals and our grains, <laughs> all of that fun jazz. And I don't know if you remember this, but that was up to six to 11 servings a day. So, and we'll talk about how that happened here in just a minute too. Okay. Um, so you have these four main, and for the most part, this is what the general guidance was for throughout the 1970s. Um, a lot of things happened in the 1950s is when President Eisenhower had his heart attack, and then all of this study and research and money went into trying to figure out cardiovascular disease, and, um, and we started attacking fat because fat was the assumed reason why people were having heart disease. Um, and I, on a previous talk, I talked about how wrong that assumption was, but we, you know, we as a country took that and ran with it. Um, so a lot of stuff happened here, um, as we were using this basic four and then, um, so this, and this was just an updated basic four, but it's the same thing. It's, it, it didn't focus on, uh, caloric intake or any of the other things that we have in our diet, it was a foundational type diet. Just make sure that you're choosing from these four food groups and you should be good. But it didn't have recommended sugar things. It didn't have recommended, you know, fat intake. It didn't, it didn't have any of that. It was just choose well from these groups. Okay. So then, basically shit hit the fan with our nutrition. Um, with this country's health was starting to go downhill. We started this war on fat uh, that which started in the 1950s after uh, President Eisenhower had his heart attack and Ansel Keys had said, hey, we've got this, um, this heart hypothesis where fat is the culprit and all of these things happened. And well, things weren't going well. Heart disease and obesity were still on the rise. Okay, so what the USDA wanted to do then was do instead of just foundational stuff, talk about total diet. Now we should talk about 
fats. We should talk about sweets. We should talk about all the things that are not a foundation, uh, part of our foundational diet, um, because it's clear that something has gone terribly awry. So this, they came out with the, their first dietary guidelines, which I think are later on in the slideshow. You'll see what the first, they were the first seven dietary guidelines, and they're almost comical um, because they're so vague. <laughs> they're so, um, and then they accompanied that with this wheel in 1984. Okay. And this wheel, I mean, it looks kind of similar. You've got your eggs, meats, and poultries, and then you, you, they've added this fats and sweet sliver. Um, they broke up fruits and vegetables into their own categories. We still have our breads and grains. Um, if you look closely, they did break that up into about half of your grains and um, breads should come from whole grains, and the other half should come from enriched grains. Um, again, this is all hogwash, but <laughs> Um, and then your cheese and milk and yogurt. Okay. So they, oh, I just said this. Yeah. So it was, they wanted to, to fo the shift their focus to not only the foundational groups, but also the groups that you should be limiting yourself on, which were at the time in the 1980s, which were considered fat, cholesterol, and sodium, because those were the culprits at the time for heart disease. Okay. Um, they were based on the, and this, the, the first guidelines, part of the like statement about how they're created is that they were supposed to be based on the latest nutritional science. That's still supposed to be the case. Okay. Um, so, and, and it's like the latest guidelines, the guidelines are updated every five years. So the first ones were, were put out in 1980. Um, the most recent ones were put out in 2020. Um, and even though legally these are all supposed to be based on the current nutritional science, the latest ones, interestingly enough, were adopted by um, without accepting the <laughs> recommendations by the panel of nutritionists who um, wanted the United States to reduce their sugar consumption. Um, and the government said, no, no, we're good. <laughs> we're not going to ask our citizens to do that, which is interesting. Um, anyway, 1980, we were in the mix of this whole low fat, low fat diet um, because that's what causes heart attacks, which is false. Okay? Um, and what that meant is that we as a nation were emphasizing more grain-based foods because those are low fat to no fat type foods, you can make a lot of foods out of grain-based stuff that are very low fat. Um, so since fat was kind of the evil at the time, that meant their recommendations were going to lean heavier towards these grain-based foods. Okay. These um, guidelines that were put out in 1980, they were based on the idea that we need to increase our carbs. They don't specify what that means, by the way, but we need to increase our carbs to about 55 to 60 percent of our calories, reduce fat to less than 30 percent. We have to decrease our cholesterol. We have to decrease our sodium and we have to decrease our sugar intake. These are the original five, uh, seven dietary guidelines. <laughs> so fun. Uh, number one, eat a variety of foods. Okay. Number two, maintain an ideal weight. Sure, that, whatever that means. Number three, um, avoid too much fat, saturated fat and cholesterol. It has since been found that that's not what leads to heart disease, but okay. Uh, number four is eat foods with adequate, ad, adequate starches and fibers. Number five is avoid too much sugar. Number six, avoid too much sodium. And number seven, if you drink alcohol, do so in moderation. Okay. Um, I love that one of them is about alcohol. Yeah, alcohol has actually been a standard in our dietary guidelines until recently. Alcohol has been one of the, if you do it, do it in moderation. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and notice that this is going for like a total diet. It addresses the sugars, it addresses the fats, it, it addresses things that were outside of the original foundational type food groups. Big um, as they are, that's what they were. Okay, so this evolved. So remember, that was in the 1980s. So this, um, the 1980s, the wheel wasn't, um, in general, they didn't like the way it looked. They didn't think it was visually appealing. Um, and so then they wanted to find a better visual representation of how they could show, like, a good graphic for the American people so that they can understand clearly and easily what it is that they should be eating. Um, 
so they actually, they actually, I won't say steal, they borrowed the idea from Sweden. The first food pyramid um, came out of Sweden and it was published by um, this woman, Anna Britt Ag Agnsat. I even practiced her name, so I wouldn't butcher it. Here I'm butchering it, Agnsater. Um, And the interesting thing about Sweden's food pyramid is that it was not built as a way to recommend food, like nutritious food to their, their um, citizens. Instead, it was built as a way to help people, help their citizens create foods that were affordable. Because what was going on is that food cost prices were skyrocketing and there were public protests in Sweden over how expensive food was. And they were arguing that they couldn't live a healthy lifestyle based on these food prices. And so what Sweden did is they split the food into what they called basic foods and, um, and supplemental foods. And the basic foods were ones that were, were energy dense and cheap. And those formed the bottom of your pyramid. And then you stack them with supplemental foods so that if you had enough money to then venture into these supplemental foods, you can add them to, to add like missing nutritional components that these basic foods in the bottom didn't provide you. So this was all created based on an attempt to give a visual representation of what would be energy dense and affordable. And notice that your energy dense and affordable foods that are at the bottom of that pyramid are grains, breads, potatoes, rices, starches, milks, cheese. Okay. So that was their basic food that they were saying that were nutritious as an energy dense, not necessarily nutrient dense. Those are different things, okay? But also affordable, okay? And then if you could afford to move up the pyramid, then, then the next thing that you should purchase would be fruits and vegetables. And then the last thing that you should purchase would be meats because those are the most expensive, okay? So mind you, this pyramid was made not for what's nutritionally best for the population, but was most cost effective that would still allow you to have some like nutritious energy, right? That's where it started. So that was back in the 1970s. So the USDA put a committee together of nutritionists and, um, and it was led by a woman named Louise Light, okay? This is what we all probably know and remember. This is exactly what I was taught in school right? This is exactly what I was taught in my nutrition, health and nutrition course, is this beautiful food pyramid, which was put out in 1992. Um, but this was not at all what that committee that the USDA that, or that the government had hired, they put together this panel, um, this committee to put together a pyramid that would help us understand which food groups to choose from and how much. And this is not at all what they submitted. Okay, even though this is what we got, this is not the, what they submitted. And this is the part that I kind of want you to pay attention to because it, I don't know, it gets me so fired up. I'm so frustrated because this had so much impact on our population. And if you look at the health statistics throughout this time frame, where we introduce low fat um, diets, where we introduced the first dietary guides in 1980, where we introduced these food pyramids in 1992, all of our health stats got worse. We got sicker as a nation throughout all of this. And I know that it's easy to look back like hindsight's 2020 and be like, what were we thinking? Um, but it's just frustrating because it, the funny thing is that when, it, that Americans actually were pretty good at adhering to this advice, right? I think that's, that's the sad part about it is that we did a good job. And even though we did a good job, our nation got sicker and we got sicker because we were being given bad advice. And here's why I get so frustrated because the leader, Louise White, she said they envisioned a diet based on vegetables, fruits, and meat with limited starches and limited grains. She said, if you put this pyramid out there, I will tell you, our nation will get sicker. And here we are. What she wanted was something 
completely different. And remember, this is the leader of the team that the government put together to give to create this pyramid. She handed it over and the government gave her this back. Okay, so if you're curious about the changes that were made, there's some of the changes, okay? She had recommended five to nine servings of fresh fruits and vegetables. When it got back to her, it was changed to two to three servings. Now, originally it was two to three servings. It had to be changed later because the, um, the American Cancer Society wrote in and basically there was a lot of backlash saying that this is ridiculous. Two to three servings of fruits and vegetables a day is not enough. But when they gave her back the pyramid that she submitted, they had changed her five to nine servings to two to three. They also changed her recommendation from three to four whole grain breads and cereals. It was changed to six to 11 servings, which now formed the base of the pyramid. And on top of that, they added things like pastas, processed rice, and crackers. That was not her vision. That's not what the nutritionists had put out there. They said three to four servings of whole grain breads and cereals. And what they got back was six to 11 with crackers, pasta, and rice. <laughs> Interesting. It also gave dairy its own section, which was not part of the original plan. Um, because remember, she was trying to push a diet surrounding fruits, vegetables, and meats or proteins. Okay? Dairy, when you give it its own section, it implies that this is somehow an essential part of the diet. But there are many cultures out there that do not consume dairy or consume very little dairy, and they're doing just fine. Okay? We've got vegans out there who are doing just fine. So to imply that dairy had to be a part of a healthy diet was not quite being honest. <laughs> and that was not a part of the original plan. Okay. And then this is what I was talking about. The baked goods with white flour, crackers, sweet sugars, these were originally all at the top to be used sparingly. But when they got it back, they had been moved down. Some of these had been moved down. These white flour breads, these crackers, they had been moved down to the bottom. So to say she was disappointed <clears throat> would be an understatement. In fact, she quoted this. Um, the food industry giants interfered with the initial pyri pyramid and it was, quote, sold to the highest bidder. That should scare you. It scares me. Sorry, I get really upset about it. Because if you think about what this did to our nation, how many people lost their lives because they were trying to follow these regulations? And how many people are sick now because they were trying to follow these regulations? It makes me sick. Oh, I'm so frustrated by it. But yeah, the, the, the food industry giants, they were, they were trying to appease them and that included the dairy industry, which is why dairy got its own. And I'm not putting dairy down at all. I'm a huge dairy eater, um, but it wasn't originally supposed to be part of our recommendations, but the dairy industry wanted their own little place, you know? Um, it also included fruits and, or not fruits, um, grains, right? Grains are uh, wheat, soy, um, and corn are, our biggest cash crops, and they're the most subsidized, cro subsidized crops in this country, okay? So the things that are made from those are said to be more necessary in our diets, things like our breads and our pastas, right? Things that are made out of those that are shelf stable, right? All the processed stuff, right? What are those, what are those going into, those crops that are our biggest cash crops? like? This is, this is frustrating how they're going to look these scientists in the eye and say thanks, but no thanks. We've got money things to deal with. That is frustrating. We should not gamble with the nation's health because of this, but we did and we're paying for it. Okay. Um, so this is what I'm saying. USDA heavily subsidizes corn, sweat, and wheat while fresh produce gets very little to none. It's hard to get help if you're, if you're growing fresh produce. Okay. The two largest cash crops in this country are corn and soy. It's insane. So they're trying to incentivize farmers to grow things that they can make money off of. And there's reasons why, because 
what do our processed food industries need to get a hold of? They need to get ingredients that help make things shelf state stable, like high fructose corn syrup, right? Corn and wheat are heavily integrated into our processed food industry. They're playing a huge role in what our own government is telling us to eat because they're money makers. It is frustrating. On top of that, I don't even know if I put a slide in there. On top of that, the sugar industry, maybe that's next actually. Yeah, okay. When these were revised, right? Remember the, the guidelines are revised every five years starting in 1980. In the 1995 revision, the committee re recommended to change the wording to eat less salt and sugar as opposed to in moderation. The sugar industry fought it. So when they were released, it said the guidelines said eat less salt, but moderate sugar intake. Okay. which is just, it's ambiguous, it's vague. You can play on those words. Like, what does that mean? What does moderate mean? Okay, so instead of like outright saying, just eat less of it, they're just saying, oh, just be moderate with it. Be, just be mindful. I'm like, oh, okay, right? These industries have a lot of power with what our regulations say for our health, which is backwards. <laughs> Just snubbing science. It's so frustrating. Um, I said, oh, the irony here, because uh, there's no nothing to support that less salt has um, improved our, um, our heart disease, um, whereas there are many studies to show that sugar absolutely plays a strong role in heart disease. So it's ironic because salt is taking a lot of the blame, salt and fat, are taking a lot of the blame for the health issues that we're seeing today when those health issues are because of the sugar that we've been eating. It's so frustrating, but who has a bigger role or who has like a bigger pull? The sugar industry. Okay, so super frustrating. Um, so then, yes, in 2011, the um, pyramid was replaced with my plate. Now, this is interesting um, because my plate actually got its idea from Harvard. Before my plate came out, Harvard came out with their own healthy eating plate because I, at that point, it was very clear that what we were doing wasn't working. We're only getting sicker. Clearly, something's wrong, right? So we got to change the graphic, but we have to change the approach or we have to figure this out because we're not actually helping our citizens at this point. So Harvard put this out, this healthy eating plate, um, and it includes vegetables, fruits, healthy proteins, whole grains, waters, and healthy oils. And I, it's kind of funny because if you read these little blurbs in the Harvard one, um, in the vegetable one, it says the more veggies and the greater the variety, the better. Potatoes and French fries don't count. <laughs> Except for starches, be careful. Um, and then eat plenty of fruits of all colors. Choose fish, poultry, beans, um, nuts. Limit your red meat and cheese. Avoid bacon, cold cuts, and other processed meats. And but what I want you to to notice is that the I want you to compare and contrast these two things. Harvard's, which is arguably less influenced by politics, there's still some academic stuff going on there um, with funding and whatnot. So you always have to take anything like this with a grain of salt. But they're arguably less influenced by, by food industry, right? Notice how their portions are. Notice that their drink of choice is water. It says drink water, tea, or coffee with little or no sugar. Limit milk and dairy and juice. Avoid sugary drinks. And they also have this little healthy oils, you know, to, to include healthy oil in your, in your diet, right? Well, USDA took that and changed things a bit, right? Notice their water has turned into dairy. Why? Because those lobbyists are hardcore. Okay. You can't take dairy off. The dairy industry will have a fit. Cannot do. Okay. Also, um, you notice that your my plate, the, they made the grains section bigger than the protein section, whereas Harvard equal size. Okay. Again, they're trying to push grains because that's the money maker. So there are some, they don't even address fats anymore. Why? Well, let's think about that. We had this huge war on fats for years, decades. Lots of money thrown at this idea that fat was causing heart disease. Lots of money thrown in the industry, the food industry, where we, we bought 
hook, line, and sinker, low fat. We put all the low fat foods and all the low fat cookies and crackers and all the low fat things. And nothing changed. We got sicker, right? So now instead of I mean, at this point, what the, what the USDA would have to do is issue an apology and say, so sorry, we messed it up for so long, but they're not going to do that, right? So now they don't even address fats or healthy oils. Like, what? It's just, it's just frustrating. Um, so comparing both of these plates is used frequently in secondary English lessons, and it's been added to health classes. Oh, that's interesting. That's good to know, Sarah, that they've got both those. Yeah, do they look, that's a good question, Victoria. Do, the, do those discussions look similar where they're comparing something that's more science-based as opposed to something that's being put out by the government and discussing why that might be? Because there's a lot of underlying money things happening here that heavily influence our dietary regulations. It's, it's just crazy. Um, so I, I mean, I think my plate is definitely a better direction. And it's, I, I, what I like about my plate is that it's more focused on proportions rather servings, which servings are so ambiguous. What's a serving size of grain? I don't know, right? Like, what does that mean? Um, what does six to 11 serving size, what is that, right? Um, this is nice because proportions are better suited for different sized like people. Um, you can make adjustments based on your own lifestyle. So it's, it's definitely moving in the right direction, but there's definitely still influence there to, to suggest here that dairy is an essential part. Again, I have nothing against dairy. I'm a huge dairy eater, but I, I also recognize that there are perfectly healthy cultures out there that don't include dairy. Okay, so I don't know why it has to be part of this kind of recommendation. Um, yeah, the, the lobbying industry, yeah. Well, is it because it's maybe too complex at that level? I think it's important for people to learn about how lobbyists can heavily influence government policy. Um, uh, the interesting thing is that, so this is taken from the USDA, um, the recommendations are in dark blue and what we're actually doing, this is from back in 2016, um, what we're actually doing. So, so see how um, they also split their grains into half of them should be whole grains and half of them should be refined. But look at what we're really doing. We're getting very few of our grains from whole grains and most of it from refined. Um, fruit, we're not eating enough. Vegetables, we're not eating enough. Protein, we're not eating enough. Dairy, we're not eating enough. But sugar, man, we're on point with that one. <laughs> like, so this is just a comparison of what they say we should be doing versus what we're actually doing. So is it working? I, I don't know. I, you know I, I just, I want us to be more mindful um, of what we're doing. These are our current dietary guidelines. These are the ones that were put out in 2020. There's only four of them. There's been a lot of changes throughout the years. Obviously in 1980, we started with seven. Uh, it moved to 10 at one point and now we're down to four. So the first one is to follow a healthy dietary pattern at every life stage. So this was in response to the criticism that the serving sizes were not diverse enough for a growing population. Like the serving sizes for a child should be different than a serving size for an adult should be, you know, different than a serving size for um, an, uh, an older, the elderly population. So follow a healthy dietary pattern at every life stage. Uh, number two is customize and enjoy nutrient dense food and beverage choices to reflect personal preferences, cultural traditions, and budgetary considerations. Wow. What does that mean? I love, however, that they are now starting to recognize that culture plays a huge role in how we eat as a people. Um, so that is really nice that they're diversifying that part. I do appreciate that because what, what I eat could be very different than what somebody in a different town eats because of our backgrounds, our heritage, our access to food. Um, and so they even say budgetary considerations. Um, focus on meeting group needs or food group needs with nutrient dense foods and beverages and stay within calorie limits. So now we're talking about calories, which is not necessarily something I would push. Um, but again, that idea of nutrient dense comes up. I think somewhere in the uh, entire report, they do define what nutrient dense means. And those are just foods that not only carry, that carry a lot of vitamins and minerals within their um, macros as well. So they've got the fats, the carbs, and, 
uh, in the proteins, but also other vitamins and nutrients to support our systems. Um, and the number four, limit foods and beverages higher in added sugars, saturated fat and sodium and limit alcoholic beverages. So there it is, the alcohol is still here, but um, so they kind of combine some of them into one that we saw earlier. Um, but this is, this is the guideline where the committee had said, we need to recommend that less than 6% of our calories come from sugar and that um, children under the age of two get no added sugars period in their diet. Um, and, the, and the USDA did not adopt that guideline. So the guidelines are still um, get 10%, less than 10% of your caloric intake from added sugars and just like moderate if you're under two or something like that. I don't remember what the actual wording is. Um, but this is, this is where there's a lot of criticism of these guidelines because they didn't adopt the recommendations of the scientific panel. Um, and they didn't adopt the recommendations on alcohol either. Part of that is because they, they didn't think that that would be practical for, for the American people. Um, but even that in and of itself is a little frustrating to think like, look what you've done to us and now you're not gonna help us unlearn so that we can relearn. Like that, that's really frustrating to me. Like, you know, we've been trying to follow these guidelines. We're getting sicker as a nation. You're offering all of these amazingly packaged foods that have a lot of shelf stability. Um, and now we're seeing the repercussions of those and you're not going to do much about it. That's interesting, cool, cool beans. Um, Let's see, so the bottom line is that we have to take our health into our own hands. It's our responsibility. We cannot rely on these guidelines because even though they are supposed to be in principle based on scientific nutritional principles, they are not. Um, there's a lot of influence money talks, okay? And, and at the end of the day, the interesting thing is that like some of those recommendations from 18, the late 1890s, actually, I think I wrote it down here. Um, in 1894, this, this guy by the name of Wilbur Atwater um, he, he had printed in the farmer's bulletin, the kind of, um, diet that we should have. And it was like, it was actually a pretty good one. It was basically, um, eat, eat a variety of different foods, keep them proportional and, um, you know, be aware of sugars and fats and starches, right? So have a diet less in sugar fat. This is in the 1890s, which by the way, is before vitamins and minerals were even um, discovered. Like this, this was this. And then um, if you need efficient and affordable foods, so back to that being able to eat cheaply, eat well, but cheaply, um, then stick to things like grains. That was his recommendation in the 1890s, which is kind of crazy. So you've seen this now multiple times where multiple people have said, if you have to get like energy dense foods, on a dime, stick to your grades. So that's food for thought too. Interesting. Um, but yeah, just don't overcomplicate it. Just, you don't eat until you're satisfied. Drink the water. And that's the other thing on our, my, my plate, water's nowhere on there. Water has not been a part of our pyramid or our wheel or any of it. It's never been on there which is interesting because water is vital. <laughs> so that's interesting. Um, but at the end of the day, just vary your protein sources, right? include protein at every meal, eat a variety of vegetables, consume carbs, but do it by way of fresh fruit and veggies, whole grains, if your body is one that can tolerate them. Okay? If not, then you can eliminate grains safely from a diet. Okay. Reduce your intake of starches and processed grains and stick to minimally processed foods. The other thing that is really important to take into consideration is that when our original guidelines were produced in 1980, remember we were focused on limiting fat and fat only because fat was, part, you know, that was the, the public enemy number one at that time. Um, it never took into consideration the um, interplay of how carbohydrates impact our blood sugars, our insulin. It didn't talk about insulin resistance. It didn't talk about any of that. So those recommendations that we get 60% of our diet from carbs, and then we see this increase in type two diabetes, I don't personally think that that's a coincidence because it was 
our all of our attention as a nation in 1980 was focused over here trying to get low fat we were we were getting a lot of grains being produced and those are low fat so what we were making money off of aligned with what we thought we needed to do to reduce our heart disease and it turns out all of that was jacked up here we are sick and notice that those recommendations haven't changed much like my plate still has a large portion of grains on there. It doesn't even specify whole on that one. Okay, so just be careful with how you're reading these things. Okay. Um, this was just kind of a fun, I like to see them all together. This, this my period in 2005 was an attempt to try to, because in 1992, we interpreted this stack as being level of importance, like most important was the bottom, and then you move into fruits and veggies, and then you move into dairy and meats, and on top was the least important, which was oils and sweets. Um, and so there was a lot of criticism about how it's not about level of importance, it's about how all these foods work together within our diet. So that's where this 2005 pyramid came from, where instead of having stacked levels so that we didn't interpret them as order of importance, instead we had like slices of a pyramid. This did not go over well, as you can see, it's a jumbled mess. In general, it was not interpreted very well and people were confused by it, even though it was the same recommendations, they just, you know, they, they're, they, they, Put them together in a different visual but the other thing that they were trying to do in 2005 is if you notice the guy on the stairs next to it they were trying to promote our activity within our lifestyles to get a more uh, um, a better look or a better view of like whole health so eat well and also work out um but it failed miserably which is why we ended up finding something better by harvard which we then modified so that it fit our governmental goals um in my plate so Oh, buddy. Anyway, there you go. Questions, comments, concerns, lots to process, lots to get upset over. But the good news is that we are making strides in the right direction. So I do appreciate that. Um, we have access to so much information now about how to fuel ourselves better, about how to make sure our families are healthier. Uh, there's a lot of dogma that we have to, we have to stand up against. Um, like Victoria said, so many governmental concerns, but not ones you can fix. Yeah, I, I have, um, I have no desire to go into the politics. They just make me so upset. Um, but, but start challenging your own understanding. That's really where I started in this whole journey is trying to challenge my own understanding of nutrition. And I just, if, if you start uncovering all of these studies that contradict one another, things like, um, like sodium, is, is really not all that bad for you, especially if you're eating a whole minimally processed um, diet, like we actually need salt. So we need salt to do any of the chemical reactions within our bodies. Um, we need salt to help us move our muscles, right? So like, that's gonna be another talk, but like start challenging, why do I feel like I can't have fat? Where did that come from? Is that true? What kind of fats are bad, right? Start challenging yourselves on those. Is low fat actually better? Not typically, right? I, do I need to eat all of this bread? Probably not. <laughs> um, so it does. It, I thought that was true too. So Sarah said, it's interesting how it feels like it's coming back around to the original. Um, yeah. And I think it's because we just tried to complicate it and we interpreted a lot of things incorrectly. And there was a lot of bad science running around there with Ansel Keys. Um, but yeah, it does. Like in 1943, it was basically, hey, just choose some stuff from these categories. And now 2011, we're like, yeah, just choose some stuff from these categories. <laughs> you know? like, uh, but I think that also supports the fact that we don't have to overcomplicate it like we have been. Like this whole, you know, like, and I even did a talk on macros last week, but I even said then, like, I don't feel like we need to go that direction with our nutrition. We don't need to take the sensibility out of eating food stop doing that, right? Like eat stuff that's minimally processed and you'll be okay. You know what I mean? Just like, that's, that's really what it comes down to eat, eat real food, enjoy some of the, you know, enjoy some of your sweets on occasion, allow yourself that. And then like, call it a day, man. <laughs> Why do we have to complicate this with macros and calories and all, you know, you need this many servings and like, no, just eat well, like eat whole foods. Um, which I know is easier said than done. So please don't think that I'm like flouting that. Like, oh, it's just so easy. That's, it's not because of the societal situation that we're in. But 
we don't have to overcomplicate it with these guidelines. And also, I'm not one to think that the government needs to tell me what we need to eat, um, especially because they're so easily influenced by money. But that's just my two cents. Um, yeah, nearly everyone knows the difference between wheat and white bread now without differentiation. Oh, I see. Yeah. The abundance of the info of each category. I see. Oh, man. Freaking government with their hands and everything. Oh, yeah. And I did, for what it's worth, I did reach out to the uh, to Peyton's teacher. I have not heard that. But Peyton came home today and he's like, yeah, I told the teacher that you, that you didn't agree with this stuff. And I was like, oh, no, that's not. Oh, OK, that's not. <laughs> That's not quite what I wanted you to say, but that's all right. Um, anyway, hope this was helpful, or at least enlightening in some way. Um, and yeah, just start questioning, questioning these guidelines, guys. Have a wonderful night. Thanks for joining me this evening. And again, no talk next week. I will be on a plane. Um, and uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, teachers of the world. I'm so sorry. Uh, <laughs> I love you all. I know that it's not always your choice to teach what you have to teach. I do get that. Um, all right. You guys have a great day. If you have any questions or concerns or comments, you know, you can always reach out and DM me or say it to the wall or, or whatnot. Um, Aaron, that's a, that's a great silver lining. That means he's listening. Yeah. On this one occasion, because let me tell you, Aaron, he's not typically listening. <laughs> oh, that kid. Oh, man. All right. Well, thank you for joining me. Have a fabulous Monday evening, and I will see you in a couple weeks. <laughs> Bye, guys. <laughs>